My name is Ernest Lamoth. I'm a reporter for the Southland Journal. My name is Judge Thomas Moore Donnelly, and I'm a circuit court judge here in Cook County. Well, Judge Donnelly, thank you very much for taking some of your time today. I'm, I'm happy to do so. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the office you're running for and what is your overall platform? So I was appointed by the Illinois Supreme Court as a circuit judge on December 3rd, 2021, and I'm running to keep the job. Uh, I've served as a associate judge, which is a judge elected by the circuit judges for the last 19 years. And I'm hoping to uh, use my position as a circuit judge to advocate for social justice. I've done that in the last 19 years, uh, serving as an associate judge. And I hope to use the increased influence that I will get from being a circuit judge, uh, which allows me to vote for the chief judge, allows me to vote on associate judge candidates, and also opens up the possibility that I might be a presiding judge. Um, to advance some of uh, the things that really uh, I hold dear, uh, and that is making the system more fair and more just, especially uh, for those who don't have money or power uh, and can't advocate for themselves within our court system. And I know one of your platforms that you're passionate about is restorative justice. Can you explain a little bit of what that is? So, uh, I'm really excited that Governor J.B. Pritzker signed into law our restorative justice bill, SB 64, on July 15th, 2021. And that will help us to move from punitive justice to restorative justice. And restorative justice is a chance for uh, someone who's been harmed, someone who is a responsible party to sit down with members of the community at a table and have a discussion about how we make the person who's been harmed whole and to welcome back uh, the person who might have harmed others into the community. And that's so important because instead of dividing, uh, it's a way of uniting people back together. Often in our society, and I served as a public defender for 12 years, the victim and offender in our system know each other. There's a relationship that's outstanding. And there's also usually a relationship that's continuing. Many times, Victor and offender are family members. And so we really ought to be spending a lot of our resources attempting to heal relationships, acknowledge the harm that has been done, see what can be done to repair the harm, and allowing people to rejoin the community and be welcomed back. And uh, that is important for public safety. Uh, because without people being a member, everyone being a member of the community, uh, our community is not safe. Because whenever you exclude people, whenever you sever the connection uh, between them and the community, they have nothing uh, that holds them um, really to a higher duty, uh, a duty of love uh, for their fellow man, because they're excluded. There's no uh, you, you've pushed them out the door. So I, I think it's a really, you know, we've, there's a lot of talk recently about moving to help and increase public safety. And I think number one in public safety is the use of restorative justice. So we bring people back in, make sure harm is repaired. Uh, and I was very excited Governor Pritzker signed this bill, which allows our four restorative justice courts to really work here in Cook County allows our restorative justice hubs, which are located in community groups and churches, not only in Cook County, but throughout the state of Illinois to do the work they've already been doing. And that's true in Southern Illinois. It's true uh, on in the back of the yards neighborhood at Precious Blood, Ministry for Reconciliation, Lawndale Christian Legal Aid Clinic, all of the restorative justice hubs we have in the city that are doing great work, work up in Evanston. Uh, we're doing restorative justice work there. Um, our community wants to do this work and actually can do it better uh, than our courts uh, and our law enforcement. And so this bill empowers them to do that and I think will make a market contribution to public safety. So I'm very excited about this because it helps us move from punitive to restorative justice. And there was another law as well too that you were a champion on when it talks about the um, consumer debt. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of the reasons why you're passionate about that as well? 
Well, I, I served for uh, five years in courtroom 1401, which is the highest volume court call in the Daly Center. In fact, probably the highest volume court call in the world. At that time, it was 600 to 1,000 cases. And what you were doing there was garnishing people's paychecks and bank accounts. Most of the people who are victims of these actions are people of color, uh, and most of them are living check to check. Uh, it is a terrible blight, um, I think, on our society that we are very um, punitive in both our criminal and our civil courts. So we allow exorbitant rates of interest and extended periods of judgment enforcement. So uh, House Bill 88, which was enacted in 2019, cuts the post-judgment interest rate from 9% to 6% and the enforcement period from 21 years to 17 years. And that's still high and long, uh, but it's not as bad as it was. And, and what I saw was a lot of times people are locked into paying judgments for their entire life. And the reason they're locked into these judgments for their entire life is not because they borrowed an exorbitant amount of money, but because the interest rates are so high. Uh, so the default rate of interest on most credit cards is 46%, 50%. Uh, and so most of what they're paying is interest. And then after judgment, they were paying 9% interest, which is much higher than you could get on the market anywhere. Um, and so they're paying huge amounts of interest on often very small amounts of principal that they borrowed. Say $600 they rack up on a credit card and all of a sudden they're facing a $5,000 claim against them because of interest. And that's the way our society is structured is that the people who have money get more money and the people who have a little money, what little they have is taken away from them. And so this bill helps, uh, while not, not making things wholly good, make them a little less bad. Uh, and I look forward to working with the legislature to further our reforms in this area. But the first step is realizing that our system, both in civil and criminal, um, hurt uh, the common person and are very punitive in the way that the law is structured. And so we have to really be, I think, focused as judges, uh, as lawyers, on reforming systems which hurt our citizens, particularly the citizens who are least able to bear the brunt of these things, both in our criminal system and in our civil system. Well, that's so very true. And I know you have a philosophy as well when it comes to anyone who walks into your courtroom. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, part of my experience as a public defender was that um, I found often my clients were hated by the clerk, the sheriff, the judge, the prosecutor, and treated with disrespect by all of them on occasion. And some of them most of the time. Uh, and the one thing I sort of vowed on being a judge is the one thing I could get for people is that everyone would be treated with dignity and respect. And that means more than just saying sir and ma'am, it means giving people voice in the proceedings, making sure that they're heard from, that when a proposal is made, if they are a self-represented party, you explain what the other side is asking for and you ask them, what they have to say about that. Uh, and that doesn't mean you rule for the self-represented person all the time or you rule uh, for the poor person all the time, but you must give them dignity and respect and you must give them voice and a sense of agency. And agency, their sense of being able to have some power in the proceedings means you have to explain what's going on in simple language uh, so that they can make a meaningful response. And sometimes they make a very cogent response and they win a motion or win uh, in a cause of action. And I would have instances like that. I had two little old ladies who were being evicted from their house and the receiver who was in charge of this apartment building uh, had not repaired the front window. This is in the middle of January. So gale winds and snow were coming into their apartment and the front door locks both the locks to the building and the locks to their apartment had been taken off. So there was no security. And these two elderly ladies were living in this apartment 
And their defense was that the landlord, the receiver, had breached the implied warranty of habitability. In essence, that they there wasn't really any rent due and owing because this facility, this apartment was not fit for human habitation. And once I explained to them that this was their defense, they put on a very good defense and won their case against the receiver and defeated the eviction. And you say, well, as the landlord, why would they wanna live in a place? Well, if you don't have any money, you may not have many choices. And at least that gave them a little time because they were not evicted to get money together, save some of their social security, get money saved for a security deposit in another place that was habitable. And those kind of things where people know that they have a right uh, to defend against an eviction uh, on the basis of implied warranty of habitability, they can do it. Uh, but I, I think one of the great ethics rules that have been changed is now we as judges have not only the right, but the obligation to give reasonable assistance to self-represented parties. And that's part of human dignity. If you just tell people, you figure it out, right? Uh, that's not human dignity because they're left there flailing and they are humiliated uh, by their ignorance and they lose uh, because they don't know anything. But it's your job, I think, as the judge to explain what are the rights that the individual has and how they can operationalize those rights. That isn't giving legal advice, that's giving legal information. Uh, and I, I think that's the kind of judge I've sought to be, uh, is that fairness isn't just watching while peaceful self-destruct, but giving people the tools they have to defend themselves and making sure that they have the information necessary to advocate for themselves. And then, weighing the facts uh, and the law as it comes in. Uh, and I think that then can result in approaching fairness, uh, which often our current system doesn't. So that's what I'm seeking to continue doing uh, as a judge if I'm elected by the people. And uh, I hope that they will um, send me back to the circuit court um, as a circuit judge. Well, Judge Donnelly, thank you so much once again for taking some time today. I'm very happy to. Thank you very much for interviewing me.